First of all, notice you can't really talk about fighting spam and not publish your own email address on everything you do. <laughs> you're either confident or you're not confident in your uh, spam fighting techniques. Well, as we'll talk about later, I've, I've owned uh, this domain and that email address for 23 years. Um, <laughs> so, okay. Well, it's 1.30, so we'll get going. So this is uh, fighting spam at the front line using DNS, log files, and other tools in the fight against spam. I'm Aaron Poffenberger. Real quick note of thanks. Uh, particularly to uh, BSD CAN, the sponsors, and the volunteers for making this possible. Honestly, I think BSD CAN is one of the better conferences, one of the more um, better return on investment. For a long time, I wouldn't go to conferences because I always feel like I didn't get near as much out of it as I put into in terms of time and money. But BSD CAN, I think, does an exceptional job. So thanks to everybody who pitches in to make this possible. Quick note about me, I'm a software developer. I've been an OpenBSD user since about 3.2-ish. I don't remember which exact version I first installed. And I've been running my own mail server for about 20 years. For a long time I used uh, SendMail because that's what was in base. And then when uh, OpenBSD base moved to OpenSMTPD, I moved there as well. So I've been dealing with spam for a very long time. And the origin of this talk comes from that experience. So running my own mail servers, running mail servers for companies I've worked uh, at. Uh, I've received, I've been receiving spam for as long as I can remember. Uh, the first couple of spams I got, I was rather naive about it. And I would respond to people very dutifully. Oh, I think you sent your email to the wrong person. Didn't take me long to figure out that that was uh, a dumb move. Probably like everybody, I've been through all the uh, client side uh, filtering tools. I've used Bayesian. I've used uh, whatever plugins are available. I've tried server-side spam filtering, spam assassin, uh, usually in, in a larger framework like AmaVSD. Uh, used, um, you know, gray listing, a lot of promise, a little bit of pain involved with gray listing. Experience working with PF. And then for the past two years, not this year, but the previous two years, I ran a tutorial on using OpenSMTPD to run typically a Soho uh, mail environment. I will be honest up front, if you are the chief spam person for Outlook.com or Google, I probably don't have much to teach you here. Uh, you all uh, have your own scale problems to deal with. But for a lot of us working at the Soho level, and Soho doesn't necessarily have to mean five users, but I'm talking not the Outlooks and the uh, Googles of the world. So the goal, this is, um, I didn't set out with this goal. These goals are kind of like backported to what I've been able to accomplish. So. I want to be able to block spam before it gets into the MTA. Analysis is fantastic, but as everybody knows, analysis, it's all heuristics, right? Um, does this seem like spam? Maybe, maybe not. Spammers do a fantastic job of, of weaving in valid data that will throw off your Bayesian uh, filters. So I wanted to avoid uh, content analysis. I want to allow my legitimate senders to connect. I want to prevent the illegitimate um, senders from connecting. I want as little delay as possible, minimum resource usage, and as automatable as possible. Kind of a tall order, but I think in, in the large, I've been able to accomplish those goals. So let's start off with a few definitions. So what is spam? This is a fairly typical definition you might see, and I've added a few bits to it. I don't think spam is solely commercial email, although it tends to go that way. It tends to be of an advertising uh, nature. One of the key um, features of spam, though, is you can't unsubscribe. And um, it's usually coming from non-canonical senders. You can't do a reverse lookup on these, find out what was the domain, find out who their uh, 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 mail admin is. Mostly compromised systems. That, that isn't to say, though, that there aren't spammers who get uh, servers at legitimate uh, locations and get proper IP addresses. But a lot of spam is just coming from hither and yon. But what spam is not is what I think would fall in that broad category fairly legit legitimate. If you signed up for the newsletter in 97 and you're still getting it, that's not spam. Go push the unsubscribe button or send an email to Major Domo and, and get off. 
If you signed up for a website and it happened to be opt out and you forgot to click the uh, checkbox to opt out, I don't consider that spam either. And there's an easy way to get out of receiving those. And there's not much I can do about your crazy Uncle Joe who sends you political email all the time. You know, Joe's still your uncle. He knows your email address. You probably do converse about normal things like family get-togethers. But um, he does go onto websites and occasionally clicks forward this link to and then sends it to you. Uh, in my book, that's still not spam. So in other words, just because you find it annoying doesn't necessarily make it spam. It might be junk, but that's a slightly different category. So let's talk about X listing just to kind of get um, you know, our, our terms down. So um, blacklisting, you know, just simply it's just block delivery from specific IPs. Gray listing is temporarily um, failing to deliver uh, by usually returning like a 451 or something. Uh, until some criteria is met. The typical criteria is I, I block you from sending email with, you know, with a 451 and I expect you to call back with um, at least, waste, uh, wait at least three, five, 30 minutes, whatever your criteria are, and then I will add you to my whitelist. And then the whitelist is always allow this uh, IP address through. It doesn't necessarily have to be a forever whitelist. Whitelists can be ephemeral, rolling 24 hours, but they can also be permanent. Okay, so let's talk about blacklisting a little bit more. I think this was one of the, um, the first simple things a lot of us tried to do was figure out, I, I used to block entire regions. There was a period of time where my, um, my rules blocked anything from China. Like, I don't know anybody in China. I'm not gonna get an email from China. I had Korea in that list. It's simplistic, um, but it, that's not really how it all started. It used to be um, people ran um, you know, open relays, right? You know, it, that, was, that was the kinder, gentler internet. Anybody could connect, anybody could send. We all sent email all around. That didn't last long, of course. You saw, we saw the rise of the, uh, the real-time blacklists, spam house and whatnot. Of course, the problem with blacklists are the, uh, the false positives. Uh, did anybody ever get on a blacklist? You go read the FAQ, and I'm not kidding you, this is pretty close to the kind of response you'd get. How did how'd you, how'd you get my IP? Somebody reported you as a spammer. How do I get off? You know, go kill yourself. Well, that's not very helpful. I remember reading lots of complaints um, years ago where people would get on a list and couldn't figure out how to get off. I think a lot of the um, real-time blacklists have gotten a little bit friendlier or they auto expire after a certain period of time, but uh, it was a real problem for a while. And of course, if you're going to have blacklists, they pretty soon beget whitelists because you want to make sure that the, uh, the people that should be sending to you can get through. It's a great idea in theory. The problem is, is how do you keep it up to date? People do change, IP, or, well, domains do change IP addresses from time to time. And it works fairly well for one domain, two domains, maybe 10 domains, but if there's 100, 1,000, how are you going to keep this up to date manually? Gray listing, I think, was one of the first really useful, fairly automatable ways of dealing with spam. Uh, Evan Harris wrote a, a paper on this in about 2003. It's based on a very simple observation that spammers don't really care whether they successfully deliver. It's the shotgun approach, right? Just fire and forget. And um, as uh, Gilles Shahad um, found when he was write, writing open SMTPD, they don't care much about the RFC. Uh, they don't care much about uh, the 451s. If they can't deliver here, they'll move on. Um, OpenBSD first implemented it in 3.5. Uh, but it is available in, you know, in some way or another on almost every platform for every MTA. But there is the problem. The chief complaint usually is from users. Well, so-and-so um, you know, from such-and-such -such company sent me an email four hours ago. Why haven't I received it? That's probably your number one complaint. I've, uh, I, I oftentimes consult for small companies to help them set up their email servers. And that's the number one complaint when I, uh, when I would implement gray listing. Uh, you know, they would complain, well, I sent an email. Why isn't that uh, email automatically added? Well, sometimes that's a configuration issue. Sometimes it, um, it just doesn't work out. This, for me, this last one was the one that really almost put the nail in the coffin for me on gray listing. Large senders like Google don't have one outbound mail server. They don't have two. They have a thousand. They have entire sub-ranges that they send. So what would happen is you'd get an email from, or you'd get a uh, connection from one IP address, you'd gray list it, and then they would call back later from a different IP address. So you'd add that one and gray list it. It might take 24, 48, 72 hours, never. 
for it to work its way back around before it got expired out. Okay, so what so what's changed to make um, the various forms of X listing viable? In some ways, not much, but but SPF is a really interesting uh, change, and I'll explain in a few moments why SPF um, helps us out. There was also an immense consolidation. A lot of companies aren't running their own mail servers anymore. They're uh, using Google. They're using Outlook. Uh, they're using some managed provider. Not all. A lot of Soho folks um, still run their own. I run my own. A lot of my customers run their own. But for the most part, we've seen a lot of consolidation. But the other thing is spammers are still often uh, using these non-canonical uh, senders and this is a key thing they also do a lot of bad things from those same IP addresses and we'll see why that's important so from these um, a couple of points we can see that um, we can begin blocking more spam at the MTA so let's talk about SPF so it's a sender policy framework you all may remember when this came out It was in the mid 2000s I think it was Yahoo that um, came up with this it's a very simple idea. Um, I'm going to publish a text record that indicates what are the valid IP addresses, ranges, or hosts that I'll be sending mail from. This is an example um, record, but the records can be incredibly long. And they can include numerous IPs, uh, like I said, IP ranges, subnets, hosts, and you can also include other um, SPF records from other hosts. You know, from other domains. So why does it matter? Well, uh, you know, 20 odd years ago, if you did a, uh, a host check on a domain, you'd get back uh, the canonical IPs for that and you'd get their MX record. There was usually a one-to-one -one correlation between MX records for, and that would tell you who they were going to send as and who they were going, or where they wanted to receive email. Um, but that's not the way it is anymore. As I mentioned before, We've seen this divergence. The large mailers, as far as I can tell, neither Google or Outlook or Yahoo or anybody use the same IP addresses for MX records that they use for sending. Uh, they almost always have that separated. But if I, um, so an SPF record becomes like an MX record for knowing uh, where a, uh, from where a host uh, domain is going to be sending its email. So if I have this canonical record that tells me which IPs or hosts are going to be sending email from, I can automate the building of my whitelist. So all that um, uh, presupposes is that I have a list of good domains, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. So, of course, you need a way to walk those records. And this is where um, a couple of projects come into play. Uh, one that I did uh, by myself, and then one that um, Gilles Shahad and I worked on a little bit together. Uh, the first is SPF Fetch. This started Actually, it started before my BSD CAN tutorial in 2016. I was doing it on my own server. I didn't invent this. I don't know who figured this out. It's kind of an obvious use of SPF. But you do need a way to recursively walk these records. Because uh, a lot of uh, large hosts like um, uh, Google will have uh, hundreds of these. But So I put together a script as part of... Uh, my first tutorial called SPF Fetch, and it does exactly what the name implies. It recursively looks up SPF records, converts them to IP addresses, and then spits them out. So now I can create a cron job, uh, walk a, a, a known good list of domains, and I can spit those out on some sort of a frequency. Uh, the frequency's up to each person. I tend to do it every 24 hours. You could do it once an hour. I wouldn't do it every 10 minutes. That's probably getting ridiculous. As part of that project, though, I started creating some other scripts. So I created a, a script called um, SPF Update PF, which takes the output of that and then adds it to um, PF tables. One of the nice things about PF tables is if you load a table entirely and give it a list of IP addresses, it will take, it will remove the ones that are missing uh, or um, that are um, that are already there but are not in the new list, and it'll add all of them. It's a very fast, very quick and effective way of updating your, um, uh, your table. Then the other thing I created was an, uh, a script called SPF MTA Capture that you can put in syslog. A lot of you may, may or may not know that syslog doesn't have to just write to a file. It can also pipe through to a process. So I use this script um, so that every time uh, the, the mailer sends an email, it uh, sees the log entries that go through, and if it sees a successful send, 
it grabs the domain for that, um, does an SPF walk on it, gets all of the um, IP addresses, and then adds them to another list, which is a little more ephemeral. Uh, I assume that when you send an email address, you want to get email back from that domain for a while. Um, how long you want to do that is up to you, 24, 72, 96 hours, a month, whatever makes sense for you. And obviously, at some point, you might think to yourself, well, if we're hitting this domain a lot, I'm going to go ahead and add it to my permanent list. Sure. Most uh, this group of scripts is all in shell, it's just plain old um, uh, shell. So uh, again, it's part of the reason why if you're running Outlook.com, uh, you really need to look at rewriting. You know, take the techniques, don't take the scripts. And some of them, uh, I'm, yeah, yeah, nothing, yeah, nothing horrible. Um, I, <laughs> okay, so then uh, last year I updated the scripts, made them a little bit better, published them in and ping Gil about them. And he's like, hey, wow, what a coincidence. Uh, Theo just asked me to add something like this to SMTP CTL because they're the exact same reason. I need a list of good IP addresses that I can whitelist. SPF records are the right way to do that. So Gil and I uh, collaborated on it. Uh, I'm going to be honest here, he did most of the coding. He'd already uh, done a lot of the resolver stuff in OpenSMTPD. He just grabbed that code, packaged it up. I added a couple of, of small things to it. And then he took all that code and imported it into SMTPCTL. I do maintain a standalone version for those um, folks who aren't using OpenSMTPD and aren't on OpenBSD where SMTPCTL is in base. Uh, I, at the end of the slides, there's a bunch of links that you can click through, and um, all this stuff is on my GitHub. And it has basically the same features as SPF fetch, uh, and it's really fast. So here's, here's what an example usage of just using SPF walk would look like. You um, call it, give it one or more domain names on the uh, command line, or you can pipe them in over standard in, however you want to do it, and then it'll just iterate over those and it'll spit out all the addresses, uh, however they're, um, they're in the record. So if it gives you an IP address, you get an IP address. If you get a, um, uh, a, a range like here with, you know, with the uh, slashes, you'll get those. It does resolve host names. It always resolves host names, so it'll never spit out anything but IP addresses. Both SPF walk and SPF fetch standalones, except the minus four and the minus six um, flags so that you can only get one uh, style or the other. <clears throat> I don't think SMTP CTL does that at the moment, but it, it'd be trivial to filter the output. If you didn't want uh, IPv4, you could just filter out the, uh, the colon, by colons, and if, it was, if you didn't want IPv4, just filter on dots. Okay, so I've given you a lot of background information. So how do I take all of this and turn it into a uh, set of techniques for actually preventing spam? <coughs> so the first part is you've got to do something with your firewall. Probably since most people here are BSD users, you have access to PF. Oh, excuse me, I've got a cough. <coughs> I lost my voice. <clears throat> okay. Well, give me just a second. We need to configure our firewall. Um, the, the key thing is whitelist should always win. If you're going to blacklist, and we'll talk about blacklisting in a few moments, you want to make sure that if somehow or another one of your known good senders does get into your blacklist, they can still get through. You could take the hardcore view and say if a blacklist, um, if you're in the blacklist, you always lose. But I found that's not very effective. When we talk about blacklists, I'll explain why. Um, and, you, and you're going to want to expire your blacklisted IPs fairly regularly. I found 24 hours is usually long enough. I think, Peter, that's what you do is you, you do a rolling 24 hours. Yeah. 
Right, and they'll be constantly re-adding themselves. And we'll talk about how I discover who should be re-added. Um, I was going to talk about this a little bit later on, but um, Peter uses a lot of the same techniques. If you read his blog, you'll see a lot of similar um, ideas. So whitelisting the known good mailers. And so who is a known good mailer? Well, for, for our purposes, again, thinking about what the definition of spam is, it's mailers who play by the rules, um, places that have proper unsubscribe links. But it is a little bit of a, um, t you know, what I call a timey-wimey, thank you, um, timey-wimey, I know one when I see one kind of thing. It's, there are a few that kind of fall in that gray area where you're not entirely certain um, who, who's the bad guy and uh, who's not. But you know, Gmail, Microsoft, Fastmail, and even Yahoo, um, although I've sometimes found Yahoo in, in my blacklist, um, and, uh, and I'm curious how they got there, because I'll see um, things that shouldn't be happening from domains that are owned by Yahoo, but that could have just been a fluke. Um, someone uh, renting a server or something. So in, in the SPF Fetch project, I have a list of what I call the common domains. And it, it's, I found this on another site. I give a link in the SPF Fetch project that will tell you where I, I got those. I also add my own. So for example, my bank doesn't happen to be in this giant list of, of known good mailers, but I trust my bank, so I know they're not spamming me. So I add a few ad hoc, but for the most part, I just use these lists, but I also use BGP Spam D. Now, if you're not familiar with this project, this is a project started by uh, Peter Hessler using BGP to distribute both white and black lists. And we'll talk a little bit more about the effective use of that. The other thing I do is I watch for outbound mail. I mentioned it, um, earlier the SPF Fetch um, or SPF uh, Monitor uh, MTA script. That's really effective for making sure domains get added. The one thing that uh, I think I, I need to add to this is sometimes I'll see a, a IP address come in on a gray list. Uh, it'll properly go through and get whitelisted. What I really need to do is then take that IP address, do a reverse ARP on it, find out which domains are associated with it, and then do an SPF walk on that domain and pick up all the IP addresses for that particular domain. That would be a very effective uh, way, because again, a lot of mailers are using more than one IP address for outbound. So you really, once you've whitelisted one IP address, you really ought to find out what are the others associated. The big problem with that, of course, is uh, getting the list of all the domains that might use that as a mailer. But since we're only blocking on IP addresses, it should be good enough. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, thank you, reverse DNS. <laughs> yeah, don't want, yeah, thank you. So who are the bad actors? Well, again, for our purposes, mailers who don't play by the rules. Um, first off, are they blacklisted by trustworthy sources? And, and that's your definition of trustworthy. I trust BGP Spam D. I, um, I trust um, the, the default entries in Spam D on OpenBSD. I trust Peter's list. You know, so there, there are places that I go to, but you may have your own. But there's also a group, um, well, anybody who sends email to your spam trap addresses, if you've set up spam trap addresses, another, uh, another good um, uh, place. But I also look for people who are doing things they probably shouldn't be doing, and I'll show you some examples of that. So uh, but briefly, our trusted back blacklist, like I said, Nick Spam, BGP Spam D, and there's so many of these, I'm not going to try and name them all. Google, you will find good blacklists. So I also do a bit of log file mining, looking for bad actors. So the theory behind this is that if I've got a compromised machine and I'm sending spam from it, I've also got a, a machine that I can do all kinds of things. And so I start looking through the HTTPD and the SSH logs, looking for strange things from IP addresses. So for um, HTTPD, so if you want to go really broad, Look for all 403 and 404 errors. It's, you know, again, if, if your white lists are good, so like for example, my mail server doesn't serve uh, any um, HTTP at all, but I leave the HTTP daemon running. So I figure if you're connecting for almost any reason to that specific server, you're probably a ne'er-do-good. And if it's, if it's Google's crawler, it's probably not going to be one of the IP addresses that they send mail from, and Google's already in my whitelist, so I'm probably safe to just go ahead and blacklist anybody who connects 
to that uh, HTTP da uh, daemon. However, if you want to be a little more conservative, scan your logs. Look for people looking for things like PHP my admin, my SQL admin. You'll find uh, these are just a few that I found in one quick scan of my logs. I I've got, um, so I actually, on my mail server, I go with the, uh, the broad scope. You connect to my mail server on HTTP, uh, I don't care who you are, you're going in the blacklist. And I'll let the, uh, so it's basically a kill them all, let the whitelist sort it out later kind of solution to the problem. Because remember, um, the, the you're looking for failures on those, right? It was on your regular website. It was on my regular mail, right. If it was on my regular HTTP server, then right, I would go for something more like um, this, this narrower scope. Well, Look, and, and smart people. Right, but part of my theory is nobody should be connecting to PHP my admin on any of my servers, and probably none of your servers either. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't care. Right, but it's just an example. Even if you're running WordPerfect on your website and you've got a WP admin, or WordPress. <laughs> wow, really, really dating myself there. I've been I've been calling WP WordPerfect for 25 years. It isn't going to end now. Sorry, WordPress, y'all are, but you're right. Um, even if you were running WordPress, thank you, <laughs> on your server, I would probably tend to use some sort of a um, pre-authentication that you'd have to do, um, you know, you have to pre-authenticate to even get to that, or I would be doing IP filtering anyhow. So again, anybody who's looking for that URL is probably up to no good in my book. So, especially looking for the URL in my book, like if I have WordPress, <laughs> I'd be down right. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, I like this one. I had never seen this one until recently. This is one of my favorite ones because you all have heard Linksys has been having some uh, interesting uh, issues. So when I saw that one in my logs, so I liked that one. So, and again, remember, if, you're white, if your um, firewall rules are set up correctly, you're going to be whitelisting all of the good senders anyhow. And then, uh, and there, I have a script that's an example of the scan log force stuff and I add them to the brute force table. Okay, SSHD. Should anybody on earth be trying to connect to your SSHD instance as root? Period. End of story. Let me, let me give you a hint. If the answer is yes, <laughs> okay, but so the, the, so the broad scope would be any failed login attempt, but really better would be any user um, that's not in your allow users or allow groups directive and SSHD config. That's probably a much more targeted view. But if you really want to go narrow, I found just grabbing IPs for people trying to connect to, as root on my server eliminates a massive number of IP addresses every single day. It's, uh, so I, every, I'll talk about this when I get to automation, but every day I get an email of, of all the IP addresses that have been blocked um, for uh, the coming 24 hours. I have a little tiny point to add there. Sure. For people who run a network large enough to have a routing protocol. So in my case, the routers are all also BSD style machines and run scans like you're talking about. And if you're running OSPF, if you black hole route people looking for SSH, mm -hmm. you instantly spread that across your entire organization if you're running OSPF. So it's a it's an easy, without actually even coordinating all of your log and right. talking, if each machine publishes a black hole route for any miscreant, you know, for 24 mm -hmm. hours, 48, whatever your time is, mm -hmm. OSPF is a wonderful way to distribute that. And it's not even just mail related, that means that miscreant is blocked across the organization. Right. OSPF. And there is a... And there is a huge debate in the community about whether you should black hole or let people connect to something like spam and waste the spammer's time. But my theory on that is, look, if they're compromised machines, am I really hurting them that much? Probably not. But it, it's up to you. Whatever you want to do, it's six of one. It's your server. You get to do what you want to do. Now, that's always my philosophy. But that is a good point. That, uh, and we'll talk about how to share lists. And OSPF is a great um, uh, for that. <laughs> right. Ah.
failed root logins, yeah, that would still be it, right. Failed logins of any sort. Right. But if it's root, you get cut off lots of yeah. And, and if you're running PF, you can also set up, um, you know, after n failures, you know, just send them straight into the, um, the, you know, the blacklist. So there, there's, there's ways of... Another addendum is that I find that most of the packet scanner idiots do it in order. So right. the lowest uh, IP address on my net block is my core router. And so it runs the, the most paranoid set of, you know, you must connect with keys, you must, you know, all that stuff. And... Because it issues 98% of the black holes, that means they never get to scan the whole rest of right. the net block. They're already blocked before they um, go very far. Okay, so obviously you're going to want to do a bit of testing with this. Whitelists are um, mostly safe. Uh, blacklists, you know, th this is where um, you can get into a little trouble. I always make sure that if I am running any kind of blacklisting that I, I ensure that key IP addresses that I know I'm going to connect can always get through no matter what. You know, so you know, a little bit of safety there. Great is, is mostly safe, but you know, monitor your logs. Make sure that someone isn't getting into the gray list and never getting out, or if they never do, ask yourself why. Um, you know, usually an IP address that appears in your gray list but never makes it to white is an indication of a spammer because um, they don't take it a second time. But um, every once in a while, I've had someone complain about a mailer that couldn't get through, and I'll go through and I'll look, and it, it's still baffling to me sometimes why they can't get through. But definitely monitor your logs. If you're using PF, then PFCTL minus T, ta you know, table name minus T show is your friend for that. Just pipe it to a, an email, send it to yourself every day, um, or put it in SQL Server or you know, MySQL, something like that. And then uh, you'll, you'll want to automate, obviously, and, and remember, that was one of my key goals for this project was to ensure that it can be somewhat automated. Uh, so all, uh, all of my scripts in one way or another are on a cron job. Some of them I put in daily.local and etc. Some of them are on cron jobs, but uh, it just depends on when I want them to run. Um, so the one that scan, uh, so I've got some that run every 15 minutes. Um, for some of the log scanning, because I want to catch things as quickly as possible. Uh, but most of my scripts work on a 24-hour rolling uh, basis. Now, you might be wondering, well, how do I ensure that an IP address I see at this time um, gets expired out? After every IP address, I put a comment, and then I put the timestamp uh, as a Unix timestamp in there, and then all I've got to do is filter out all of those um, that are older than 24 hours. And that, that's how I keep my rolling. Um, and one of the nice things about PF is when you load a table, it, it ignores comments. So you just load them in, and boom, you're done. That's that's right. So you could use minus capital T as Actually, I think I do. Now that you say that, um, I, I'm using the timestamp somewhere. Um, maybe another script, but you're right because I do use the minus T expire. Well, uh, Yeah. So that if you're doing like the black hole idea, your log watching software usually has that function if you're using it. Right. You also need to have a file where you put temporary whitelist to it. Hi, I can't get in. Oh, yeah, you, you, know, you, put a, you, you forgot to change your password on one of your devices. You got blacklisted. You know, so I've got a little bit of ways to get in. Yeah. So, gentleman mentioned having temporary whitelists that you can add uh, folks to. And so you need a way to share these um, lists across your servers. Uh, OSPF, uh, as one uh, gentleman here mentioned, uh, BGP spam D is a great example of how you could use BGP to um, share uh, black and white lists across your various servers. Uh, you know, if you're running a, a really small Soho mail server, you probably don't have anybody to share with. Um, but, but you can use it also, since, since I have um, small clients that I sometimes work with, I can share between them, and so I can create a much bigger list because I've got access to more servers. The more servers you have access to, then the more information you can gather. And the other thing, nice thing you can do, you could um, pull from BGP spam D once and then distribute amongst all your hosts so that you don't have to hammer uh, Peter's server. Um, you know, you know, kind of jokingly point out, you know, if you didn't go to um, Peter's tutorial a couple days ago, BGP is not hard to learn for this purpose. If you want to use BGP for what it was designed for, you really need to spend some time studying it. But to use it as a mechanism for um, distributing whitelists and blacklists, 
it doesn't take a whole lot of, of study to learn how to do it. And I, I've stumbled across tutorials on the internet where people are doing exactly this. Okay, so um, one of the objections when I tell people about what I'm doing here is, well, isn't there a risk of blocking uh, legitimate senders? And you know, if you've been paying attention, I keep hammering on, make sure your white list always win. Um, and, and that's really your, your fail safe. As long, uh, you know, so I really don't care what goes up in my blacklist because one, my mail server is orthogonal to everything else that's going on. I don't run um, HTTP on the same server, uh, or at least to serve things. I do, like I said, I do run it as a way of collecting uh, bad actors, but I don't use it for anything. So I keep my mail server completely orthogonal. And so that, you know, for the most part, you're, you're pretty safe there. And then, you know, some obvious questions since I've uh, been talking a lot about OpenBSD. You notice there wasn't a whole lot of OpenBSD-centric ideas here. You don't have to run OpenSMTPD to do this. You can use PostFix. You can use mail if that um, turns your fancy. Uh, you do need something like SpamD. As far as I know, SpamD has not been ported elsewhere, but there are SpamD-like um, plugins for uh, many of the MTAs, although unfortunately they don't tie in, um, uh, you know, the, they're a filter in the MTA, so the MTA still has to accept the connection and then shunt it off. There is one exception we'll talk about in just a few moments. PostFix has a really interesting tool that um, works in front uh, before PostFix. Uh, our SpamD uh, has a, a gray listing module. Again, you don't have to run open SMTPD to use SMTP CTL, but if you don't have it already installed, you could get the SPF Walk standalone version that uh, I maintain, or you can get SPF Fetch. Um, those are the only three tools that I know that actually do SPF recursive walking. So, um, but uh, none of them are open BSD um, centric. Some other interesting options. Post Screen is a really interesting tool on PostFix. It's kind of a um, Swiss knife version of everything we've been talking about today. It, um, it has more heuristics. I'm not going to try to describe it. Because I, didn't, uh, I thought the, there wasn't a, enough documentation for me to get a real good feel for it, but it does work in four layers. The first layer is to try and catch these, um, you know, your, your gray list. Um, and the fourth layer is you know, things like OmavisD or RSpamD. Um, but the cool thing is it accepts connections on port 25 and then hands them off to PostFix, which means it doesn't work with your favorite mailer because it's handing off a file descriptor. And if your mailer doesn't know how to receive a file descriptor to then receive the connection, you're done. So as far as I know, PostScreen will only work with PostFix if someone goes in and does some uh, rewriting. And then, of course, you know, we all know about the post-MTA frameworks like AmaVSD and RSpamD. They're, they're um, both really fantastic. The chief difference between them is RSpamD is written in C, whereas AmaVSD and, and a lot of the components Perl. are Perl. Yeah. And, you know, and the, the, it's highly performant. A lot of people are using AmaVSD. Actually, it's AmaVSD new, in case you're not familiar with that. Um, it, it's good enough. Um, the one thing I would suggest is if, you're, um, if your environment is not purely Linux, um, perhaps Mac OS or one of the BSDs, you probably still need to run one post MTA uh, scanner and that would be something like Clam AV. Um, the, the other thing I would suggest is if you're not doing DNS filtering for known bad actors, OpenDNS is a, is a great tool for that. Uh, fairly inexpensive. They have a free tier for you know, home and family and small office. But um, basically what it'll do is if it um, sees a URL that is a known phishing site or something like that, it'll redirect them to a landing page that you can configure and tell you know, the user, hey, go see IT about this. Okay, so now you might be wondering, well, will DKIM and DMARC help me out at all on filtering spam? And the answer is, eh, broadly, kind of no. <laughs> and the reason why is they're not really designed for that. So uh, SPF, as we talked about, is uh, analogous to MX records for um, who is sending email on behalf of, domain, of a domain. DKIM is just signing the outbound mails. You publish your, your public key in DNS, 
and then other um, uh, senders can look that up, check um, the, the signature, and say, okay, not only did it come from an authorized IP by this domain, but it came from the authorized MTA for that domain. And, and that's really critical for spoofed email, but guess what? If you're running uh, you know, spambots.com, you can publish a DKIM record. I've seen this in my spam before. I've gone through and looked at it. Wow, nice DKIM uh, signature there. It's still spam, so it doesn't help you much. Plus, the point is to prevent people from sending it as you. As you, right. It, it, it's fantastic for helping you know, suss out. Um, did you, and one of the, uh, well, actually, with DMARC, it's the nice thing about DMARC is it takes both SPF and allows you to um, publish records for what to do with failed uh, email that, that's yeah, that's the key thing is. I think you're bad-mouthing DMARC, I'm not sure because DMARC. No, no, I'm not bad-mouthing DMARC. What I'm saying is. It's the most promising attempt to fix the basic problem of email. The basic problem is the authenticity of the sender. Right. But, but if I'm running spam dot, spambots.com and I'm. Right, this is true. Yeah. But, 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 but my point is, for, for pre-MTA filtering, DMARC doesn't help you much. For pre-MTA. This is correct, but it, what, it lets you, what it lets you do is build better whitelists and in an automated way. A lot of spam. That's right. Now that I agree with 100%. Um, right. DMARC is very effective for that. Um, so yes, um, but my point is for the, you know, I'm, I'm most interested in blocking spam before the MTA. I think DMARC will help a lot, but it, it, for this purpose, for this specific um, goal, DMARC isn't going to help you much. Uh, but what it does do is it helps you with your own domain. Uh, it helps you immensely. I, one of the things I'd really hope that DMARC would help out with was that companies like um, Google or Outlook, whatnot, would, um, would whitelist other domains more quickly. One of the, uh, to this day, Outlook.com sends emails from my domain to most people's junk mail. Because uh, I'll give you all a tip. If you ever change IP addresses, you've got a good IP address that's got great reputation, do overlap. Bring up the new IP address first, put it in your SPF records for a month or two, because uh, a lot of, of um, domains will um, transfer reputation from one IP address to another IP address if they see it associated with a good IP. I made the mistake when I recently switched um, providers is I, I immediately cut off the old IP address thinking that my domain had the reputation. Huge mistake there. It's the IP address. It should be the domain. I've had the domain for 20 plus years, but you know, so, again, I, I, I'm not bad-mouthing DMARC. I just don't think for these purposes it's the precise uh, answer. It's an answer. But close to what you are doing, it actually goes up to the root problem. I, so we should push for DMARC as much as we We should push for it, but it's not going to solve the problem of, of just basic unsolicited spammers sending from hither and yon. It solves the problem of spoofing software. It's the main problem we have. It, which means a spammer has to buy the which actually costs money. Yeah. Once sending mail costs money, then it's actually effective. Yeah. Let's look back on this in 10 years and see what DMARC's actually done for us. But I do agree, rollout is a huge part. Well, the only way we're going to push for it is if, if, people, if domains start enforcing um, DMARC and requiring DMARC from all senders. Right now, in five years, it might be. Uh, in five years, DMARC might be broad spread enough that we could start blocking domains that don't have uh, DMARC. But right now, DMARC is a question mark as to whether it's going to actually um, put a dent in spam. It has potential. 
Okay, so is it effective? So I'm just going to use the example of my domain. It was registered in 95, so I've had it for 23 years. I've used the same primary email address for those um, 23 years. I, I'm almost certain it's on every spam list known to spammer kind because they share these things. I publish my email address everywhere. You can find it in um, uh, you know, Google Groups. You can find it on, you know, in, in some of the OpenBSD lists. You can find it in commit messages. You can find it all over the Internet. I am well known. And as I noted at the beginning of the talk, it's in all my slides. Um, and my email address is the domain catch-all. So if, you know, even if I'm not in their spam list as AKP, I am also as Aaron, Joe, Bob, AAA, A123, um, admin, root. I have all email addresses that aren't already allocated. Right now, I typically receive zero to three spams per week in this domain. Occasionally, I'll see a peak of, of five in a week. But um, by and large, I don't see a, a whole lot of uh, spam. I, I've got some other domains that I'm implementing this on, rolling it out. Um, I, I, what I'm hoping, though, is, is I know there at the bottom, you know, um, the, the plural of anecdote is not data. <laughs> so do I have analytics? Not yet. And, and the reason why is this was built. Um, is it due to any, any post that you made? No. No. Nope. It's all pre-MTA. Pre I, I used to run Clam AV, but I, I somehow or another misconfigured it out. <laughs> and, so, and since I run mostly, uh, we only run uh, Max and BSD in the, in the network, I, I'm not worried about um, that's, viruses. That's, that's the thing I hate is like, like this, when it, a post is, is silent dropping. That's right. And I, and I always, even if it's a false positive, yeah. I want the balance to go yeah. back. Now, there is one other thing I do. I debated whether to put the slide up, and I didn't, so I'll just tell you all really one of the other things I do. On my account and my account only, when I put something into junk mail, and it's marked red, I have another script that goes through, mines the IP addresses, because the assumption is, is if I looked at it in junk, I left it as red and didn't move it out, that it's crap, and I want it to go in my blacklist. So that's one more place where I uh, mine IP addresses, is from my own junk. I wouldn't roll this out broadly, because it requires the user to understand it has to be in the junk mail, and it, if you leave a good email in there as red. Now, of course, your whitelist would probably, um, again, save your butt. But, you know, um, I, I, that's right. As, as someone who does a lot of networking for people, there's, there's two things I'd add to any spam protection program that are actually important than just being a good neighbor. OK. And first of all, except for your mail server, block outbound 425. No one needs it or rarely needs it, and blocking it like, when a PC gets hacked for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. it, outbound 25 is, is an often, you know, often becomes a spam source. The second thing So is, you're talking about egress from the network? Yes. Yeah, so okay. Block, outbound 25 is Okay, mail yeah. That forces them, if they're going to send mail, through your mail server. That said, they will save. So the second thing is put a script on your mail server to, and you can put a high number, like 1,000 recipients. Right. Per IP address. And that, that second block is now you're forcing them to go through your mail server. You've got a, a central choke. And if it's a spammer, they're going to trade to do way more than a thousand. But a th it's a good number to start because you won't catch many normal users sending to a thousand recipients in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And that means like you're counting the recipients, not the number of emails. Because mm -hmm. spammers will send, you know, yeah. a thousand recipients in one actual email. So, so just to, for those who are playing the home game, the gentleman suggested, make sure within your network to be a good neighbor, block outbound 25, force everybody to go through your own MTA, and then put maximum outbound recipient um, uh, values, like 1,000 users. Uh, the other thing some people do is they also do outbounds, outbound scanning. Yeah. A lot of ISPs by default do that. Uh, for, a lot of ISPs do, for a lot of businesses, a lot of people who have their own solo mail server, obviously that mail server is getting out, so they might be on a service that has a lot of Right. Right. Okay.
So analytics, like I said, I, this was built through this was built through accretion, and so I, you know I didn't start out with the intention of well how do I build a pre MTA filtering system. I built it up through accretion, and so at first I didn't worry about analytics. You know, my, my analytics were, oh gosh, my inbox doesn't have that much spam. That's good stuff. But I want to be able to show that. So I, I'm working on some ideas about how to count denied connections versus actual connections, count um, the amount of spam that came in that was actually um, junk um, versus what wasn't. So th you know, this may require a little bit of coding, but I've got some ideas about how I may be able to accomplish this. Those may be um, by EuroBSD or Asia or BSD CAN next year. I'll actually have analytics and I can uh, demonstrate uh, how well these techniques work and give you real numbers. And, and part of what motivated me to do this is one of my um, friends whose um, domain I work on often has a Barracuda. And his Barracuda does give that kind of data. I was like, oh, that's kind of useful. I'd like to have numbers like that. Um, so inspired me. Okay, so where can you find the code? So SPF Fetch is um, the project script. There are a few scripts that aren't in there yet that I need to push, so just watch the project. Um, there's a link at the end of the slides, and on the Contact Me slide, um, it's just githubs.com slash A-K-P-O-F-F. I'm A-K-P-O-F everywhere I want to be known, and if I don't want to be known, then I'm somebody else. A few odd credits. Um, Gilles um, from the Open SMTPD uh, project. Uh, partly for um, you know, writing OpenSMTPD, which has uh, made my life a lot easier as a male admin, but also um, chatting and um, converting SPF Fetch to a, a nice C project for SPF Walk. Uh, Peter, whose blog I follow, uh, and uh, actually I think I follow his, his tweets more often. Then I go to the blog, and you know, but uh, Peter uh, rants frequently about. Uh, you know, spammers. They're good rants. This, this isn't bad ranting. This is you know, really effective, good stuff. Obviously, the OpenBSD developers, uh, you know, PF, uh, really, PF is a lot of the core of what makes all of this work together. I, any good um, firewall should allow you to do a lot of this, but since I work on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, just stop there. It's all PF. <laughs> uh, but really, seriously, PF has made, um, it does um, help me out immensely. I, the folks who took my tutorial the past two years asked me a lot of questions, pushed me hard on ways to do things. How do I solve such and such a problem? And then, of course, um, the folks who show up, um, talk to me before and after these things, coming to BSD CAN, sharing uh, thoughts and ideas on how we can fight spam. Okay, so, do you have questions? I might have answers. Right. And, well, nothing, nothing right. Level, right. Yeah, so, so for the home viewers, what Henning said is, this is all fantastic, but in the case of stolen credentials, and we've all, uh, you know, we all receive these. Someone's Yahoo account gets hacked, and uh, their email, uh, you know, everybody in their address book all of a sudden starts getting spam from them. Well, I've seen it both yeah. I've seen spam coming through Yahoo and Gmail. Right. Right. If you have users that are legit large amount of mail senders, this is really hard to do, so we kind of like block them, but they detect quickly. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the script that what most people don't do. The right. Script, the script that, 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 that I run every few minutes has, like, uh, you know, it's in Python, so it's an initial hash that says this IP is 4,000 and this IP is 10,000, and if you're not in that list, then you're 1,000. Well, mm -hmm. that's the solution to right. that. Well, but it doesn't even have to be. It doesn't even have to be a thousand. One, uh, one of my um, clients uh, turns out um, the, um, his secretary was all of a sudden spamming all of his customers, but his customer base is under a thousand, and so limits like that wouldn't have caught it. So in that case, uh, outbound clam AV scanning was the solution. Was to um, scan all the outbound emails. Gentlemen, they're yeah. in the. Credentials go up to some farm and they come in all, all different. Yeah. So you have to look at the accounts. 
Yeah. Well, the leaders that you're having, in my case, like, so it's over the it's over a historical thing. And if they're over, we give them a good big window. And if they're over that window, they need to be changed. Yeah. Have, yes, sir. Uh, uh, just, sorry, I'm going to keep talking about if you're an ISP. There's, there's actually two things that you might do when you call yourself an ISP a DSL provider and a hosting provider. Now, we're both, but we farm out the, the, the DSL. So we don't care. That was the answer to the, the, question, the question before. I can block everything because the DSL is. That's somebody else's problem. So I just block everything and, and turn it on. But from the the hosting side of things, um, rather than block looking for like a thousand a day, I look for like a hundred an hour or, or something like that. And oh, that's great money. And I stop. Yeah, yeah great money. And I, I stop at and report. I get reports in my email says somebody's sending a lot. You know, but if they just wait, they can send some more. Mm -hmm. So I don't stop them all of them immediately. But <laughs> yeah. And and I can with you change the password, call and say, hey, you know, so if you have a new password, you know, go and don't give it, you know, don't use password one anymore. So real quick, um, there's nobody in here after um, two thirty, not until three thirty, so we can keep talking. But I just wanted to throw up some quick contact details, and then um, mention the links. Uh, and, and these are just a few odd links. Uh, I'll put the slides up onto the BSD CAN uh, website. I also, on my GitHub, have a repo called Talks. You can find all of my old talks. You can find my SMTPD uh, tutorial. I've, I've heard from people that, that it is possible to follow the tutorial without my personal presence and build a mail server. So um, give that a whirl if you want to build a server. I would recommend, I've known a lot of people who've quit running their own mail servers because they, one, thought it was too hard, or two, didn't want to deal with the spam or whatever. It's really not that bad if you're willing to put a little bit of time into it. This isn't a set and forget kind of thing. Like uh, if you're running a static blog and you put it in HTTPD, all you got to really do is run your updates from time to time. But a mail server does require a little more care and feeding. But it is possible to run a Soho mail server and um, derive real value from it. But uh, as right. Oh, is it 245? Okay, great. So, you know, feel free to um, grab me afterwards. I'm, I'm always happy to talk about these topics. If you um, find issues with the scripts, uh, you think I could have done something better, you've got diffs, send all that in. But I, I, I probably won't get the repo updated until I get back to Houston because I've got a 6 a.m. flight. So uh, give it a day or two if it um, doesn't seem like I'm moving very fast on getting that published. But thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.